rather than looking at the world through the lens of the Bible. And so the lens that we look thing, at things through, it colors what we see. And these young people were interested in one of the most hotted, one of the most heated and contested things they wanted to discuss. They wanted to talk about Roe v. Wade, these college students. And they wanted to have a serious conversation around what does the Bible really have to say about abortion? What does the Bible have to say about conception? When does life begin? And for over two hours, there was one of the topics, along with a host of other topics, we talked about just simply from what the Bible has to say. And these young people, with all of this intellectual acumen they have and all the learning and training that they're receiving at some of the most prestigious universities in the country, at the end of the day, they have decided that it's the word of God that they need more than anything else. And it's the word of God that our community, our society needs more than anything else. The same thing happened after uh, Tuesday, when I spoke Tuesday night, and I finished speaking, I think, at around about uh, 10 o'clock. I, I spoke for 40 minutes, and I was through at about 10 o'clock. And when I finished, I was ready to go back to my room and, and just retire for the evening and regroup and get ready to get up early so I didn't miss the flight going, coming home like I missed the one leaving. <laughs> that was all Ben's fault and Danny Dyes' fault. <laughs> But anyway, afterward, they, they had me up until 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, asking questions, penetrating, probing, trying to understand what does the Bible have to say. And so I say to the young people here this morning, you young people here, I trust that you will develop that type of spirit. That's why I'm encouraging you to get on the Bible Bowl team from Grace Bible Church so that we can raise up a group of young people whose mind has been shaped by the Word of God, who really love the Word of God, because what this society and community needs more than anything else, it needs people who really are committed to the Word of God and showing the relevance of the Word of God in real time, in real life situations. The problems that we face today in our society, they're not merely economical. We face an economic crisis. We face an economic crisis because we have a spiritual crisis that we're facing as we have abandoned God and as we have abandoned biblical principles of morality and honesty and decency. And now in our pursuit of wealth and affluence, God is allowing us to be judged by our own greed. And now we find our economy in shambles and we're groping and make no mistake about it, this is a serious, serious situation. And you have the leading economists in the world basically saying if you have money, then spend some of it. If you don't have none, don't you go out and get more credit because you make the situation worse. And if we need some type of economic stimulus to take place. And this new administration, this new president-elect will come up with some game plan and take our money and try to reparlay it to see if some kind of way we can get a better outcome by spending it differently. But I just stopped by to tell you this morning, my beloved friends, I'm hopeful and I'm encouraged and I'm praying for this new president and this new cabinet, but I don't believe that the answers to our nations will be found in politicians, whether it be presidents or whether it be Congress. But the answer that this nation needs is for the people of God, not the people outside the church, not the people out in the world, but for the people of God to turn their faces back toward God and bow down before him and cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I am available. Use me. Use me to be an agent of change. Use me to be one of your foot soldiers in your army that's taking this gospel, the grace of God, to men and women and boys and girls. Use me to bring hope and help and healing to broken people. Use me in your hand as one of your weapons and agents of change to bring about transformation in the lives of individuals that can result in families being transformed and neighborhoods and communities being transformed. This is the church's time. This really is our time for us to rise up like a mighty army and say to people, we really do know the way. And that way is by following Jesus Christ and by abandoning ourselves and putting our faith totally in him and submitting ourselves to his word and his authority. Well, in this particular passage in Luke chapter 11, this is a sad passage. It's a sad passage because these people had been exposed to the truth of God as articulated by Jesus Christ. 
Many of them had witnessed his miracles. They had listened to his profound teaching. They had gained spiritual understanding that they had never had before by a teacher like none other than had preceded him. But they had rejected his truth and they had rejected the light that he was offering. And the rejection was so severe that they challenged him and they challenged his spiritual authority. He's casting out a demon. And in this particular time in Palestine's history, demonic influence was running rampant, just like demonic influence is running rampant in our society today. We don't have explanations for some of the bizarre, wicked, decadent behavior that we see people uh, displaying. And so we try to explain it away, my beloved. This is what happens when we give ourselves over to our own philosophy, our own idea, and our own wisdom, and we are opened up to the influence of demonic spirits. So Jesus has cast out a demon, and he has muted the demon where the demon could not speak. And the Bible says that some of the people in the crowd challenges his spiritual authority and by saying he cast out demon in the name of Beelzebub. Now, we don't understand the real significance of that. That was a name, Beelzebub was a name that the Jews had embraced. It was one of the deities of the the Akronite people in the Old Testament. And it was a term of derision. It was a term of insult. And they had embraced this term to describe the most wicked demons in Satan's diabolical cohort. And so for them to say that Jesus was casting out demons by Beelzebub was an estimate to say that he was, himself was infested with demons and that he was in league and that he was in partnership with the chief demon. Be not deceived. God is not marked. If you live long enough, serve God stridently enough, boldly enough, if you serve God with enough conviction and compassion, determination, and resolve, then someone will call you everything but the child of God. They said he is a devil. He cast out demons by the devil. And that's how dark a culture and a society can become. It can become so dark that it looks at the truth and he calls the truth a lie. And these were religious people. These were people that had been exposed to the Old Testament Judaism. They had the law and they had the book of God. But having the Bible in our proximity is not the same thing as having the Bible in our hearts and in our minds. Can I get some help? Just because we come to church every now and then, just because we show up at the church and we are in the presence of, of people reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and preaching the Bible, it does not really mean that we have truly accepted the Bible as God's found authority for all faith and for all practice. And that's the issue today. The issue today is what really is the final authority? Who really does speak for God? Is it popular opinion? Is it the loudest? Is it the slickest? Who really speaks for God? What really is the authority? What really is God saying? So they, in essence, they rejected him as being God's spokesperson, this one who was God wrapped up in human flesh. And they challenged his spiritual authority, and they say he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. He is in league. He's fraternizing with demons. Now look at Jesus' response. Another group in verse 16, they want to test him, and they sought for him a sign from heaven. But in verse 17, he gave them a sign, and they just didn't recognize the sign. The sign that he gave them was divine omniscience, because he was the divine know-it-all. So the sign that he gave them is that he read their minds. Their hearts were naked and open and barren to him, and so he discerns what they are thinking, and so he responds with the answer to what they're thinking in their minds, and that should have been a sign. They didn't even pick up on that. So in verse 17, he knowing their thoughts, he says to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. Now, Jesus was not one that was not, that was afraid of using logic. Just logic. He says, okay, if a kingdom is divided against itself, if a nation is in a civil war against itself, is there a civil strife within a nation? And how can it put up opposition against an attacking enemy? If a house is divided against itself, 
how can that house withstand an attack from the outside? So in essence, what the Lord is saying here, he says, you're saying that I am in, the, in a league with Satan. If I'm in a league with Satan and Satan's kingdom should have crumbled a long time ago, if I'm casting out demons in the name of a demon, if demons have actually turned on themselves and are fighting each other, then why is your land still so polluted with demons? He says, Satan's house can't stand if it's divided against itself. He says, but if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, verse 19, whom do your sons cast them out? Then where is their authority coming from? Therefore, they will be your judge. But verse 20, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. This is the dividing line. Jesus is trying to get the people to actually look at the situation you find yourself in. You guys have been oppressed. You've been dominated. There are people with b bizarre behavior and conduct and actions, and there's absolutely nothing you have been able to do to rid yourself of these influences. Because the strong man, Satan, has been wreaking havoc and having a field day in your land, in your life, in the lives of your children, in the lives of your nation. He says, but then a stronger man has shown up, and that stronger man is me. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, he is the stronger man, and he has the authority. He has the authority and the power to disarm Satan. He has the authority and the power to excommunicate Satan from areas and from arenas. And he does that to demonstrate that the kingdom of God has come in power. What those young people did in Atlanta was very, very important. One of the pastors came who had went out, his church had sent out some people. He says, I have 900 members in my church. And he says, you got to understand it was a Baptist church. So in a Baptist church, and I'm from the Baptist tradition, anytime a Baptist pastor says how many members he has, just divide it by two. <laughs> just divide it by two. And you got a more accurate number because the 900 is grandmama and grandpa, and we'll never take nobody off the rolls, you see. People move away, we still counting them, it doesn't really matter. Just, just divide it by two, and then divide that by two-thirds, and you probably got, multiple times two things, you got, probably got the average attendance. But he says of my 900 members, 450 are accurate, he says, I've got 10 people that will do evangelism. 10. And he says, those 10 would not go into the neighborhoods that y'all went into today. See, there's something that is regal, that is courageous about young people. And spiritually, that's important. That's important because we need people who still believe God, who haven't been talked out of their faith yet, who still believe that God is a big God and believe that God can do big things and believe that God has called them to do something large, something meaningful, and something significant. That's where they don't draft people like me to go to war. Because I'm going to be talking, we, I don't know if we can do that or not. We, I'm going to be calculating and trying to decipher and trying to figure it out, see. They don't want old people in the army. They draft young men, you know, take them by volunteer basis now, and young women, people who still believe that with their strength and their will and their determination and their resolve, they can subdue the enemy. And so Jesus was saying to the people, a stronger man has come. Don't you want to be associated with the strong man? Normally people want to be around a winner. Don't you want to be with the one? A stronger man has come, the one who can bind up this evil, wicked one who's been destroying you and can loose you and free you and set you free so you can be all that you have been called to be by the grace of God. Oh, I wish I could have some help today. I run into people every single day through the thoroughfare of life. They come in and out of this church. Lives are in shambles. They're dealing with issues from back in their past and the present, their own addiction their own mess that they have created, and for the life of me, you offer them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they want everything but Jesus. 
They want everything with Jesus. And I try to reason with them, don't you see, your way just simply isn't working. Your logic is not helping you. You're getting yourself in deeper and deeper. You've taken a wrong turn, and you keep on taking wrong turns. Only Jesus Christ has the navigation system to get you back on track. You got so many things going on, no human being can fix all of that. You need a stronger man, and only Christ can do that. It is the truth of God that we must herald, and we must thunder from the pulpits and in our daily witness and try to call people back to the simplicity of faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can get ourselves back on track. So they challenge his spiritual authority. He says, a stronger man have come. And with the finger of God, I'm casting out demons. Whose side are you on? God is dividing the right from the wrong, the righteous from the wicked. It's just time for those who name the name of Christ to decide whose side are we really on. Are we going to identify with Jesus Christ? Are we really going to embrace this call and this challenge that he offers to us to be to take up our cross and to follow him and to be his disciples? Are we going to seek to live our lives out in such a way that people can see that we're living our life as best we can based on the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth because we're trying to be good disciples of the Lord? Jesus said, if you don't get with me, then you're against me. There's a time when neutrality means that we are against him. When he calls us to align with him. And in 2009, I believe that God is calling those who name the name of Christ to really align with him. And to align with the people of God. And to align with the church. And I trust by the grace of God, if God moves you to be the Grace Bible Church. But line up with the church and be count as those who name the name of Christ and who believe that God has placed you somewhere to use you to help advance his kingdom as he's advanced it through the Grace Bible Church or through somebody's church. Are you with me? The day of spiritual free agency is over. Spiritual free agency is over. I mean, I listened to one player last night. He said, I'm not going to play for this team no more. Well, they didn't want him to play no more. That's why they benched him in the beginning of the year. They didn't want him to play anymore. They let him in the game last night so he can so he can still run, so they can trade him to somebody. So when you're a spiritual free agent, you're looking for a better deal. Brother Levi, a better deal is what you're looking for. So in free agency, a player comes to the end of his or her contract, and then they want to parlay themselves on the open map market of the NFL or NBA or baseball, where the sport is, to see if an owner will offer them a better deal. So some Christians are acting like they're spiritual free agents and somebody else is going to offer them a better deal. I just thought about to tell you, there ain't no better deal than the deal that Jesus Christ offers us. It is the best deal that we can have. To receive eternal life, to have our names written down in the Lamb's book of life, to be laborers together with God, to be gifted with a spiritual gift, an ability to be able to serve God and enjoy doing it. There is no better deal than that. You better get on and sign the contract and get on the board and be a part of this good, good old gospel ship called the Grace Bible Church, that you are identified with him. There are, there are blessings, there are, there's protection, there's a shield that comes from being identified with him. So Jesus says, if you don't gather with me, then you're, you're scattered against me. And then he tells a little story. It is a simple story, but it's very profound. It is very profound. He says, now, if a man has an unclean spirit, the unclean spirit goes out of the man. The unclean spirit is always looking for some flesh to habitate. See, spirits need a body to habitate, to actually do their work. So the unclean spirit, he goes out, he's trying to find a body to habitate. Then he found this individual that had been exposed to the truth that he was cast out of. God can cast something out of folk, but once he cast it out, you got to put him in, you see. you got to put him in. And so now... The spirit has been cast out, but the person never really received Christ. They never trusted him. They never filled with the Holy Spirit. So the spirit shows back up at the same house. Said, this thing has been cleaned up. 
It's been swept. This is a good place for me to live. And goes out and gets seven other spirits worse than what he was. You better be careful coming close to Christ and never really embracing Christ. You better be careful never really totally surrendering yourself to Christ. You may set yourself up to be a greater target for the enemy's attacks. And there are a lot of people out there that are pseudo-Christians. They think they got enough salvation to get them out of heaven, but they really don't have the right thing at all. But they never really put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus says you better be careful. And that, as he lays out to them, the consequences for rejecting spiritual truth. There are consequences to us as Christians. See, we think that all the consequences are just for the non-believer. No, there are consequences that we as Christians encounter for rejecting spiritual truth, for rejecting the authority of the Bible, for not allowing the Spirit of God to really shape our minds where we're really trying to live our lives in accordance with the Word of God and consistent with the truth of God. So they challenge their spiritual authority he shares with them the consequences for rejecting the truth. The crowd seeks for a sign, and he says, there's no sign going to be given you. I'm not going to give you any sign. But watch before he says that. I want to close right here. In verse 27, and it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you. And the breast which nursed you. Now, that sounded good. <laughs> that sounded spiritual. She said, bless the womb that gave birth to you. Bless your mama for carrying you for nine months. Bless your mama for giving birth to you. Bless your mama for nursing you on her breast. Bless your mama for taking care of you. And Jesus looked at her. He said, it all sounds good. He says, more than that, bless are those who heed the word and keep it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and who keep it, who realize that the truth has been unpacked, that the truth has been offered to them. Blessed are those who receive the word of God and who keep it and who abide by it and allow it to bring fruit into their lives. Well, the last thing as we wrap this up, Jesus then shares the true power of evil when people are seeking something other than him, as the crowd seeks for a sign. Look at verse 29. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. And while the crowds were quickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given, it, given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. And you know who Jonah was, don't you? Jonah was the rebellious, backslidden prophet whom God called to go and preach the good news to the enemy of the Jews. That was the problem. Jonah wanted God to destroy the city of Nineveh. It was a wicked, decadent place, and there had been a long time the enemies of the people of God. And so Jonah wanted God to be gracious. He just didn't want God to be gracious to his enemies. So Jonah refused at first to go and preach the gospel at Nineveh. And so he hitched a ride on the ship going in the opposite direction. God caused a great storm to come on the ship, and he revealed to others on the ship that Jonah was the problem. They didn't toss him overboard, and Jonah is swallowed up by a great fish, and he's three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. God can get our attention if he wants to, man. He can get our attention. If he wants to get our attention, God can get our attention, and so God gets Jonah attention. If you read the book of Jonah, Jonah has an epiphany in the belly of the whale. Jonah is a prayer warrior in the belly of the whale. He cried out to God in the belly of the whale. He repents in the belly of the whale. Now, if we don't want to serve God, God can grab us up by the back of our necks, and he can put us in a situation or a circumstance and hold us right there until we yield to him and surrender to him. God can put us in a full nest and just hold us right there. That's he did, Jonah. He says, no sign is going to be given you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For if Jonah became a sign to the Ninevite, so also the Son of Man be to this generation. Don't you know that you never know who you are assigned to? Jonah underestimated the power of God in his life. He never realized that God could use him to bring revival to an entire nation of evil, wicked, 
decadent people. Don't underestimate the power of God in your life. Don't underestimate the power of God to use you to convince someone else they need to know the Lord. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit and his anointing on your life and on your witness as you tell your story of how you've overcome by the word of your testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Jonah shows up and he preaches to the people at Nineveh and the king of Nineveh calls for a national fast. For the young and the old, he says, who can tell maybe God will spare his judgment if we repent? God is looking for people to use as a sign. And you and I don't realize how close some people are to judgment. Judgment for the individual is death. So when the person leaves this world, they have had the last chance to respond to the gospel. Are you listening to me? There are people that you know this year that are going to die. There are people that I know this year, they're going to expire in 2009. None of us really know how old we are. We just know when we were born, at least when they told us we were born. So they tell us when we were born, they give us a piece of paper called a birth certificate as to when we were born and where we were born, but we don't really know how old we are because if you are 18 years of age, but if God has set your boundary where you're going to be 19, you're already a senior citizen, you just don't know it. So there are people that you and I know that are going to exit this world this year, and God has put us in a position to be close to them, and we're just like Jonah who showed up for the Ninevites. We may be their last witness that they get. The last chance they get to hear the gospel, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to cast caution to the wind. Start telling everybody you come in contact with about Jesus Christ. Start inviting people to the church. Become a spiritual pest, a spiritual nuisance. Don't give up because people's eternal destiny is way in the balance. So Jesus says, just as God gave Jonah to the Ninevites, God has given me to you. God has sent heaven's quintessential prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, truth wrapped up in flesh, God incarnate. God had sent the greatest preacher, the greatest prophet, the greatest witness, the greatest evangelist that they would ever have the opportunity to hear. He was in their midst. And then he goes on to say, but you rejected the truth and you rejected the light. So the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus goes back into antiquity, and he summons this for first kings, the queen of Sheba, this powerful woman from the south, and she heard about Solomon. She didn't believe what she had heard, so she packed up a caravan and she traveled hundreds of miles to come all the way to Jerusalem just to meet a man named Solomon. And when she got there, she saw his ascent to the house of God. She saw his happy service, and she heard his wisdom, and she said, the half hadn't been told about your majesty and about your glory. Jesus said if the queen of Sheba came all the way to, from the south and she just to hear Solomon and she was won over to believe that he was God's man, how much more should you be won over because a greater than Solomon is here? And he was speaking of itself. Solomon was great, but Jesus is greater than Solomon. He goes on to say that when you light a lamp, you don't put it in secret. On the basket, but on the lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. That's what God is calling the church to be, my beloved. We're supposed to be a light in a dark place. We're supposed to be like an oasis in a desert land. We're supposed to be a healing place in a place of hurt and pain and destruction. And so it's now time for the Grace Bible Church to stand up and be all what God has called us to be. To stop looking for a comfortable place, convenient place, or resting place. We're going to rest after a while. Now's the time to work. So if you're going to teach Sunday school, now's the time to teach. If you're going to work with the youth, now's the time to work with them. If you're going to sing in the choir, now's the time to sing in the choir. If you're going to be a part of outreach, now's the time to do it. If you're going to give... Now is the time to give because the day is winding down. It's going to be night 
when no man can work. It's time for us to put our light out there, to let our light so shine that men might see our good works and glorify our God and our Father who is in heaven. That's the only way, the only way that the darkened eyes are going to be open. The only hope for your family member who's held hostage by sin and addiction is the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. And maybe your job is just to keep on living it and keep on praying. Maybe you've said all you can say, you've, you've done all that you can do, and then maybe what your job is just to keep on living it and keep on praying and keep on being nice to them, even though they might be cantankerous and evil toward you, just to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There are people that you work with, and they're aching, their heart is broken, and they don't know Christ. And they need for somebody to let their light keep on shining, to maybe give them hope, to dispel the darkness that blinds them. Maybe the bitterness and the hurt and the pain that's gripped their heart and that clouds out the revelation of God. Our job is to bear witness and to keep on witnessing. And you young people don't realize how strategically placed you are. This generation of young people who know the Lord Jesus Christ are the most important soldiers in God's army because you have your feet firmly planted in two worlds. The world of this young generation, the world of this culture, information, the technology, you understand it. But you also have your world firmly, foot firmly planted in the church. And so you're getting the spiritual insight and spiritual understanding and you can be the conduit through which God communicates to this generation his love and his grace and his mercy. Most people in the church, they don't have a clue what's going on in the world. Don't have a clue of what's really happening in the streets and what's happening with young people today. This generation of young people, they're our link, they're our connection to this world. And we gotta use them as a bridge to get this gospel of Jesus Christ out. So, beloved, I trust that in 2009, that victory will indeed be mine and be yours as we together just surrender to be all that God called us to be. With this strong of people here this morning, if we're really serious about serving God, God can use us to really have a tremendous impact in this community where we are situated, to touch the lives of families, men and women, husbands and wives and children, and to lift up the light of the gospel so that people might be saved. This might be their last opportunity, their last chance. And let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. Let us bow together, shall we? Father, we thank you for this opportunity once again to be with your people. And Lord, we submit and surrender to your spiritual authority. And we, we receive and embrace your truth. And Father, we don't seek a sign because we believe that your word is true. And it's already proven itself to be true in our lives. And we know the power of light to dispel the darkness as it dispelled the darkness in our hearts and caused the light of the gospel to shine that we might see Jesus. I pray right now, Lord, that maybe someone here today might open their heart to receive the living Christ. And say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I believe that you died on the cross, you were buried and raised from the dead. Come into my life and save me, Lord Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning, you've never received Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you just as you are. And he loves you too much to leave you as you are. And he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a perfectly sinless life, to be betrayed and crucified, that he might be the substitutionary, sacrificial lamb of God. He's died in your place. He's died in my place. He's taken the punishment that we deserve. We can receive forgiveness. We can receive a pardon by turning to God and saying, Lord, come into my life and save me. I trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. 
I could think of no greater gift that you could receive this first Sunday in 2009 than to trust Christ as your Savior. Is there one here today you just want to be saved? You're tired of this lonely walk all by Jesus yourself, tired of the sin, tired of shame, tired of guilt, tired of uncertainty of not knowing. You can know today. Way too long. Don't you want to be saved? Jesus saved. Don't you want your name written in God's Lamb Book of Life? Jesus Don't you want to experience saved. forgiveness? Is there one here today? Right where to you are, just raise your hand and so do you say, I just want to be saved. Jesus saved. Is there one? To the utmost, Jesus saves. He Maybe will you're already you saved. You need just to, to, to surrender to Christ. This first Sunday in 2009, decides you're going to live for him. Now is the time. Today is the day. Jesus this is your hour. Saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. Yes, Lord Jesus. To the utmost, Jesus says. Right where you are, if you already know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're living for him, we'll what are you right up. where you are, say, Lord, I just surrender to you today. Turn you I want to be all that you want me to be this year. Help me to be all that you've called me to be. Use me the way you want to use me to advance your kingdom. And I want to ask you just to, to pray right where you're right now. Ask the Lord to reveal it to you either now or whenever he chooses to do it. But how he wants you to serve him in and through this local church. I love all of y'all dearly. Do anything for you. But so many of you are, are, are functioning below your spiritual potential. You have so much more to offer God. There's so much more that God wants to do in and through you. And we need your help. We need people to help teach our kids in the nursery. We need people to, to help to support our Sunday school efforts with, with our young people. We need someone to help uh, as a few people have come together, Sister Sarah Brown and others who want to do some things for our youth this year, our team. We need people to step up to the plate and say, yes, Lord, I, I'll give some time. Jesus saved. Let's prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's table, the communion. Amen. Amen. Bless his holy name.